Welcome to the first ever Dad Built DIY Pro Ride Along. Over the next two days, I'll be riding along with Vassar Fencing of Central Ohio as we build a six foot vinyl privacy fence. They'll show me the ins and outs of their craft and share some valuable tips for DIYers and professionals along the way. We'll see how these guys mix manual labor with precision and craft. And later on, I'll get to have a candid conversation with these pros to hear their perspective on this job and the industry. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. You probably know me by now. I'm a DIY guy, and you can DIY just about anything, but some projects you might not wanna do yourself. For me, that was installing a six foot privacy fence. I got hooked up with Nate and Cam after I saw a beautiful fence that they had installed in the front of my neighborhood. I could tell they were craftsmen and that got me interested in learning more. All right, so I'm here with Nate and Cam LaVasser from Vassar Fencing. Nate, Cam, thank you so much for letting me ride along with this process. Yep, you're welcome. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about what we're doing today. So today we're gonna be installing a six foot tall vinyl fence. Um, it's Savannah Styles from Weather Bulls right here in Columbus. Awesome, and I hear you guys do a lot of wood fences, is that right? Yeah, me and Cameron actually have a background in carpentry, but doing carpentry our whole life. So a lot of customers seek us out for our custom wood designs. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to learning about the process. Let's get started. Absolutely. So who are Nate and Cam Lavasser? They're two brothers who grew up in a remote place called Beaver Island in Lake Michigan. They have a background in carpentry and custom woodwork. And about two years ago, they started Vassar Fencing in Central Ohio. And since then, they've built hundreds of fences around Columbus. What makes Vassar Fencing different from other outfits is their emphasis on quality and craftsmanship. They use the best materials, they don't cut corners, and they do the job right. Nate and Cam brought their fencing crew with us on this job. Three hardworking guys that should help us finish on time. We'll get to know each other more along the way, but for now, it's time to get to work. And our first day was all about manual labor. Day one was hard work. We needed to dig all our holes and get the posts set in concrete so that they could start curing and be ready for the next day's install. It's critical to the process that we get this done today if we want to stay on schedule. So we started running our string lines. This process would define where our post holes need to be dug. Of course, there were no shortage of obstacles to overcome on day one, and they started right away. See those utility boxes? They're not on this lot, but the underground lines run right down the center of these two property lines. The orange is buried cable, and the red is buried power lines. Most people like to have their fence hug the perimeter of their property, but the position of these boxes made this impossible. Oh, and code stipulates that there needs to be three feet of space around the utility boxes so that they can be accessed. The solution we came up with was to bring this side of the fence in about three feet. Once these posts passed the utility boxes, we could taper the line back out to our corner. Digging over utilities is serious business. Safety is the first priority, but also Ohio code stipulates that you are personally liable if you hit a utility within 18 inches of the marked lines. So all the post holes on this side of the property needed to be dug by hand. That's hard work. For the other post holes, the work wasn't so bad. We used a skid steer with an auger bit to drill those and it was really cool. I learned something at this step. It has to do with how you space your posts. Here's Nate talking about how Vassar might do this different from some other companies. We do it, and I think other people don't do it because it's more work to do it this way. We can only achieve a certain amount of panels out of um, the, the width of the rails on our, on our fence. So, we just make every single panel the same width. When you could run eight foot panels all the way down until you have um, a panel
handle to, to fit because it looks better. Um, symmetry always looks better, but that involves ripping and cutting pieces for every single panel, right. as opposed to wait until the end and only make it one panel. But it's perfect symmetry. Yeah. 43.3! I wanted to use the auger, but my talents were needed elsewhere for something a little more manual. I'll say Nate wouldn't let me use the auger. You need me do this instead. But even here, Nate had some good advice on how to improve my skills. You want to watch how you open your pulse digger because, see, when you open it with this arm, it's going to activate this traction <laughs> muscle. Okay. And this arm, it's going to activate that one. So if you're doing it with the same one every time. If you're doing it with the same one every time like I was, yeah. see that? Oh my god. Look at it. It doesn't exist. You got like over a trucker's tricep there. I'm one right. arm. I'm one arm. So far, day one was all about solving problems and scratching around in the dirt. And there was a lot of dirt. So one thing you need to consider if you're gonna do this yourself is dirt removal. Check out all this dirt that we pulled out of these holes just today. So if you're doing it on your own, make sure you have a plan to get rid of all this dirt. One thing I appreciated about Nate and Kim's process, they always work a couple of steps ahead. While we were finishing up hauling away the dirt, Cam was bringing in pallets of materials for the next step. Our holes were dug and we needed to start setting our posts, but that's when we ran into another problem. Remember how we moved the fence line to get around those underground utilities? Well, as it turns out, we set it right on top of a main line for an irrigation system. And that line was running right through the center of our holes. It was an issue and we weren't sure what to do. So this irrigation line running through the center of our hole is a big problem. If we're not able to figure this out, we're not going to be able to set our posts in the time that we need. I'm going to make a call to the irrigation company that installed this system and see what they recommend. We took a beat while I called the irrigation company, and they talked me through the process of cutting the main lines so that they could be repaired and rerouted later. We cut the lines and taped over the cut edges so no debris would get into them, and we started setting posts. If you think that dirt is heavy, wait till you start lugging around 80 pound bags of concrete. A fence job like this requires a lot of concrete. Look at how much concrete we're using to set these posts. And this is where I learned something else about doing this job right. You need a bag of dry concrete to get the post initially set and leveled. But after that, posts should be set in wet concrete. Here's Cam talking about why that is. I'm using my foot to like use as a counterweight at the bottom of the post. So that way I'm not trying to like look at the line and hold it like this. So you get it like just how you want it and pour it like bag in. Yeah, I'm, I'm adding a lot of downpour so that way the post doesn't move around. Yeah. Once you have the post set the way you want it, then you can take the critical step of adding in the wet concrete. But not all companies are going to do it this way. Here's why Vassar does. They tell you that the moisture will cure up the concrete. Well, where's the moisture come from? It's coming from the ground, right? So how deep does it penetrate into the concrete before it starts curing? It's got you a 90 know. minutes of time. 90 minutes. So, Unless it makes it to the core of that dry concrete in 90 minutes, then there's there's now a concrete barrier to keep it from curing the rest. There's, there's never, plenty of stuff like that, you know, like a black aluminum or a chain link, you know, except for the termination posts. Like that stuff I could see being dry port. But you're talking about building a solid wall that doesn't have any breathability and you're trying to stop the wind when it gets up to 60, 70 miles an hour. It, it gets windy back in your Right. If you're going to do that, why then? Like you should do a wet or a concrete. After doing this so long, we just set that as our standard. We don't go through and say, well, this fence breathes really well. Yeah. We're going to drive for it. We just, unless there's some crazy situation, we just assume every fence is Yeah. Good. We're just going to do it right. We're just going to do it for every single yeah. day. We worked ahead, staging the posts, and then adding in the wet concrete. Nate and Cam worked behind us, checking everything to make sure it was perfect for the next steps. Setting these posts is really when you start to feel like you're making progress. You can start to see what the finished product is going to look like. 
So you've got different types of posts for the different sections of the fence. This is a corner post. You can see that it's routed here and it's routed there so that your rails are gonna come in on each side. These are a blind post. You can see that they're routed on both sides in a series so your rails are gonna go straight through. These are end posts. They're routed on one side and they're blank on the other side. We're gonna use these for all the gates. With our post set, we were ready for the next day. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this pro ride along. If you've made it with me this far, do me a favor, give me a like and a subscribe down below. I hope to keep making really cool DIY videos and I would love it if you would join the crew. Be sure to catch my conversation with Nate and Cam after the big reveal. Oh, one more thing. If you're a pro in the Ohio area and you'd like to show a DIY guy a thing or two, hit me up. I'm looking to do more of these ride-alongs. All right, let's get back to the project. Welcome back. We're about to start day two of our DIY pro ride-along, and I'm really excited about what's in store. It's a lot colder today than it was yesterday, so I think my first order of business is going to be to start a fire to keep the crew warm. We want to finish this fence today, so to do that, we need to get all of our rails, pickets, and gates hung. Some of that work goes quick, and some of it not so much. Nate set up his miter saw for the cross cuts, and Cam would work the table saw for the rips. I like how these guys work a few steps ahead. When we set the posts, Nate took measurements for today. That way he's able to cut the materials while the crew does the install. Cam showed me some of the specialty tools they use on a job like this. What's this tool you're using here? This is a notcher, so it is putting in the factory clips that it, each rail comes with. Okay. But since we cut our own, we put new ones into the vinyl to lock it in so the rails can't slip out. So when we're putting in these rails, like on a slope where it's coming downhill, we'll put our own notches facing uphill so that way when the resistance is pulling on the panel, it's going to have a lot harder time coming out. The bottom will lock in first, and then the tops will just lock in one side. And then that way... So you can get the picket. When we in. get to our last picket, yeah. Once you start getting into this area right here, you're going to have to start leaning the top rail out to be able to get them the rest of the way in there. The crew locked in the bottom rails and staged the pickets at the same time. While day one was the hardest of the physical labor, day two was all about precision and craft. It's these fine details that separate out the professional work. So Cam, you're just gonna open that hole up more so that it fits with the angle. Yes, because as this grows, vertical is gonna stay vertical, but this length is gonna grow. So I have to open this up to accommodate the new length that we have on such a steep angle. Just come back through and touch it up with a little sandpaper. Just take off all the little birds and stuff. But uh -huh. it cleans up pretty quick. Before too long, all of those holes in the ground started to look like a fence. Yesterday, Nate and Cam talked about taking the extra steps to make the panel symmetrical. Now today, I see what that entails. Cutting each rail and ripping pickets for every section of the fence. It was all coming together quickly. After all the rails and pickets go in, it's going to be time to build and attach the three gates. Taking a break for lunch gave us an opportunity to get to know each other better. Nate and Cam talked more about their background in the skilled trades and what it was like to grow up in one of the most remote places in the continental U.S. 
the guys from the crew are Venezuelan, and they talked about the difference between construction work here and back home. No surprise, they said back home was so much harder because everything was made out of concrete. We saw some deer out back in the field. There's really good camaraderie in a small crew, and it was cool to be a part of it, but now it was time to get back to work. We needed to hang three gates. Gates come in a kit that we had to assemble, but we made some small adjustments to them to fit our design. The, the pockets they put in there, there's no way for us to build a new grade. Even if we custom put these pockets in, as soon as that angle changes, it's gonna bottom these out to where they can't be. It has to go in square, you know? So there's minimal adjustment we can make. We made this one wider. We ripped a picket, added an inch, and so we subtracted how deep these went in there by a half inch on each side to make that gate wide to match that. While Nate built the gates, Cam installed the hardware. So even like suppliers, I think, you know, they'll offer like aluminum uh, gate post stiffeners for uh -huh. the hinge side. We'll actually, we actually throw them in on both sides just so like you know, when that gate's coming slamming close, like yeah. a high wind or anything like that. So, we so always, what's the gate post stiffener? It's in the post itself. Yeah, it's an I-beam that sits in there that's made of an aluminum. Now it was time to hang the gates. We had to make some small adjustments to make sure everything was even, and that was that. I'll be honest, when I started this ride along, I thought this whole process was pretty cut and dry. But spending two days with Vassar and their crew, I saw the true craftsmanship that goes into the work, and I learned that it's the combination of manual labor and precise skill that makes a quality end result. But the most important thing they demonstrated was that family and the close bond of a tight crew are an invaluable nuance you won't find with every professional. You can see it in the end result. This is all going on. Okay. So you're looking for a, yeah. <laughs> this is live right now. Live, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's live. <laughs> so Nate and Cam, I'm a DIY guy, but I know when to call a pro for a fencing job like this. What are some things that you recommend you should be asking a fence pro before a project? So you want to ask questions like what materials they use. Uh, you want to ask questions like how they set their posts and what their processes are. You want to make sure that they take their time um, there's a lot of times you can find a, a cheaper guy to do the project, but it's because he's cutting out some of the processes that really draw in the quality of the final product. Um, so things like, do they string line and level all their posts? Are the posts being set in wet or dry concrete? I know we use some dry concrete at the bottom, but that's just another step we take um, to add a little more quality and aesthetically pleasing um, features to our fence but then we add the wet concrete in there uh, for the longevity. How important is it to choose the right materials for a project? Uh, materials are huge, like we use weather bowls right here, local to Columbus, um, and we refuse to use the bracket system. I know um, a lot of companies sell it, and in some designs, you can really only get the bracket system, but um, for a standard six foot tall privacy fence like this, um, the solid panel, you're gonna want these uh, slip style uh, rails instead of the brackets. Okay. So that's huge. Great. 
What are some other things you need to consider when starting a fencing project? You want to look at the gr type of landscape in your grade and how saturated the soil is. One thing people don't take into consideration is like, especially with vinyl, you know, they do sell nine foot posts and eight foot posts. They sell bracket style systems. We try to stay away from the bracket style system and go with the slip rail. It locks in and we put, can put screws into the top to secure that even better. Um, if you have like saturated soil and you're trying to set an eight foot post, you're going to be 24 inches in the ground. That's something you might want to stay away from if you have a high water table. We set concrete at the bottom to bring it up to grade for laying a clean line across the fence before we concrete it in. And those are all things like a DIY guy like myself, like I, I wouldn't even think about that when you just said about a high water table. Right. Why should someone call a pro to do a fencing job? And, and the thing about calling a pro is something like this, you know, it looks basic and straightforward, but we're able to kind of see 12 steps ahead all the time just because we've done it so much. We have the time and this is all we do really. So when we're going out here setting posts, we think about, you know, what, what's going to happen at that corner down there or mm -hmm. along the fence line in the middle right there, we have this situation and we can see that stuff and adjust before we start assembling because we set all our posts first and we can make those adjustments where a normal DIY guy might set all his posts, start assembling panels and get to the point where there'd be conflict and then the entire project could go askew because you might have to take back, you know, three panels in order to make up for whatever situation you ran to right there. So knowing those 12 steps is going to be so huge. And that's a lot of projects. I mean, um, it's all a learning process. So we've just been doing it long enough to kind of cut some of those, uh, those sure. hiccups out of the sure. What obstacles do you typically see on a fencing job? I know like even on this project, there were a, a number of hurdles, obstacles that we had to get around, right? Uh, Cam, you were showing me how to, you know, cut into those posts to make sure that you can get around an angle or over there where we had to like widen out the space. Like how common is that in a project that you guys are doing? Like how many of those obstacles are you typically seeing? I'm glad that's something that actually came up on this. It's not something we have to do every time. Um, in a couple of the, in the instance by the gate, um, the grade was steeper than what the panel typically allows, so we had to adjust the post there. Um, that's not something we have to do very often, and then we also got a transition over here where we were using line posts. As a DIY guy, you wouldn't know what you'd have to do. You could, you could get your post set into the right places and things like that, but when we were digging our holes, we knew that we had to make adjustments in these spots and we had to cut and we had we so when we were digging the holes we knew what tools we needed we knew what circumstances we were going to run into we knew that we would have to cut those notches bigger in order to accept the rails so then we could figure if our materials would work there too on some of our grade changes and stuff before we even got, got there yeah how important are efficiency and process I was really impressed by just the efficiency of your process and how you did this. I mean, we were digging the holes, and once, as soon as those were done, we're putting the posts in. You're cutting the the rails. You're cutting the the materials. You guys are always working one step ahead, like of the next guy. And I think just the efficiency for this to go in in a day and a half is right. Right. Um, wild by, you yeah. know, by, yeah. by DIY standards. It's a, it's a, it, there's a lot of work and we wouldn't be here right now doing this if we couldn't be as efficient as we were. You know, our guys are great at staying one step ahead of us and then we stay one step ahead of the guys. So there's never really any dead time, you know. As a DIY guy, I'm sure you're gonna get out here and there's gonna be times where you're scratching your head wondering what the best next step is. You know, is where we've been doing this long enough to where we know the next step and we can always be ahead of each other. Why did you choose to specialize in wood fences? If you're looking to build a fence, you've got different options, different materials that you could be using. I know we did a vinyl here that had to do with, you know, I had just a couple choices and vinyl was the best one uh, for me. But let's say it didn't have those restrictions. I could choose a wood fence, I could choose a vinyl fence. Can you just talk me through like why why would you choose a wood fence? What's some of the benefits there? 
Um, and, and why would you choose a vinyl fence? With vinyl fences, we're restricted to um, the materials we have. You know, we have eight foot panels and we have six foot tall. So on certain grade changes, the way that those panels or pieces are cut, they're cut at six foot square. So if you're going up a steeper incline uh, for a grade change, um, it's gonna expose some of that square cut edge as where um, in wood, we can order longer materials and we can cut it down and we, we can manipulate it to be exactly how we want it. You know, uh, wood comes in uh, a ton of different lengths. Mm -hmm. So we aren't restricted as much. Okay. Yeah. It's easier to be perfect with wood because there's so much more you can do with it. Sure. All right, so we're all done. I think everything turned out really good. Nate, Cam, thank you again so much for letting me ride along with your process. Yeah, you're welcome. And Brandon, seeing our processes and seeing everything we did here, um, what did you learn? Did you take anything home? I think I learned a lot about how a pro approaches this process and a lot of things that had I been doing this project myself, I just don't think I would have considered. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so Nate, Cam, how can people connect with you? So you can find us on the internet at VassarFencing.com or you can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram at VassarFencing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. We'll see you next time.